Let us now take our Bibles for this afternoon. Uh, our scripture reading is taken from Joshua chapter 5, 13 to the end of chapter 6. So Joshua chapter 5, starting at verse 13 to the end of chapter 6. Starting at verse 13. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Chapter 6. Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus shall you do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. So Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, take up the ark of the covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horn, horns before the ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, go forward, march around the city, and let the armed men pass on before the ark of the Lord. And just as Joshua had commanded the people, the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord went forward, blowing the trumpets with the ark of the covenant of the Lord following them. The armed men were walking before the priests who were blowing the trumpets, and the rear guard was walking after the ark while the trumpets blew continually. But Joshua commanded the people, You shall not shout or make your voice heard, neither shall any word go out of your mouth until the day I tell you to shout. Then you shall shout. So he caused the ark of the Lord to circle the city, going about it once. And they came into the camp and spent the night in the camp. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. And the seven pre priests, bearing the seven trumpets of the ram's horns before the ark of the Lord, walked on. And they blew the trumpets continually, and the armed men were walking before them. And the rear guard was walking after the ark of the Lord, while the trumpets blew continually. And the, sec and the second day they marched around the city once and returned into the camp. So they did for six days. On the seventh day, they rose early at the dawn of the day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, shout for the Lord has given you the city and the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab, the prostitute, and all who are with her in her house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But you keep yourselves from the things devoted to destructions, lest when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. But all silver and gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted and the trumpets were blown. As soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout 
and the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they captured the city. Then they devoted all in the city to destruction, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys with the edge of the sword. But to the two men who had spied out the land, Joshua said, go into the prostitute's house and bring out from there the woman and all who belong to her, as you swore to her. So the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and mother and brothers and all who belonged to her. And they brought all her relatives and put them outside the camp of Israel. When they burned the city with fire and everything in it, only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron, they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. But Rahab the prostitute and her father's household and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Joshua laid an oath on them at that time saying, Cursed before the Lord be the man who rises up and rebuilds the city of Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn shall he lay its foundation, and at the cost of his youngest son shall he set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was in all the land. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we look to the Old Testament and read or hear about the accounts of historical battles or conquests, we regard them with a lot of interest. There are amazing victories that we see that come upon Israel, and also some justified defeats. When we hear these narratives, we definitely can come away with a sense of awe. Uh, Look how God won this amazing victory. Look at that power, that majesty. Often these texts can give us this idea or feeling, but for many of us, it is tempting to think that this is all there is to these accounts. These these battles might seem just too distant for us or too irrelevant to have any impact on our day-to-day lives. Yet, this way of thinking is totally incorrect. Really understanding the conquest at Jericho reveals to us our God, the sovereign ruler over all the world who secures both victory for his own people and destruction for those who remain in rebellion to him. And the victory God secures at Jericho teaches us about how we are secured in the victory of Christ. In today's age, we may not fight with swords or arrows, but make no mistake, we are all in constant battle. And depending on how we are fighting, right now we may be losing or we may be thriving. So this afternoon, we are going to look at this conflict between Israel and the Canaanites, the people who are living in Jericho. And we will explore this passage under the following theme and points. The Lord shows Israel he is the source of victory at Jericho. By the command of God, through the faith of Israel, for the life of God's people. So point number one, by the command of God. So as we begin to read in Joshua chapter 6 about Israel's conquest, we may wonder why Israel, the people of God, we're going to war and fighting other nations in the first place? Well, to answer that, we need to go back to the land, uh, the land promise that was first given to Moses while Israel was still in captivity. In the first part of Exodus chapter 3, verse 8, the Lord speaks to Moses saying, And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites. In Numbers 20, it details the the account of Israel's exile after they had escaped from captivity. Moses and the rest of Israel had problems when it came to trusting, when it came to trusting God to do what he said he would do. 
They were in the desert, and while they were nearing the end of their 40 years of wandering, the Israelites came to this specific desert, the desert of Zin. And there, there was no water. And the community turned against Moses and Aaron. So Moses, Moses and Aaron went to the tent of meeting and heard from God, who told them both to gather the people, speak to the rock, and that water would come forth. What happened next was that Moses took the staff and gathered the men. Then, in anger, Moses struck the rock twice with his staff. Water came from the rock, as God has, had promised, but God told Moses and Aaron that because they failed to honor God as holy, that they did not trust God, they would not bring the children of Israel into the promised land. So time passes, Moses passes away, the people of his time and generation pass away, and we have this new generation of Israel, and this promise of this land flowing with milk and honey still stands. Joshua's generation was to enter into this land that God would give them. But there is a problem, and it's a rather big problem. The other enemy nations already live in that region. In the past, these enemy, enemies terrified Israel. There's one specific instance where Moses sent spies to map out this land that God had promised would be theirs. And the spies see the land, they see the enemies, their cities, and the strong people that live there, and 10 out of the 12 spies lose all confidence, all faith in God. They return to the people of Israel, and they spread this fear to the people. So Moses rightfully rebukes them, saying this in Deuteronomy chapter 1, 26 to 32. And um, this is quite a, a bigger passage, so why don't we all turn to this passage in our Bibles so, so that we can read it together. It's uh, Deuteronomy chapter 1, starting at verse 26 to 32. Chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse, starting at verse 26 to 32. Verse 26, yet you would not go up, but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. And you murmured in your tents and said, because the Lord hated us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to give us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Where are we going up? Our brothers have made our hearts melt, saying, the people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to the heaven. And besides, we have seen the sons of the Anakim there. Then I said to you, do not be in dread or afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight for you, just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness where you have seen how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son all the way that you went until you came to this place. Yet, in spite of this word, you did not believe the Lord your God. The enemies, the cities that are fortified to the heavens, all of these, all of these things were a great cause of concern to the people of Israel in the past. So as Joshua is leading this new generation of people, Joshua would have known about the enemies he is about to face. So you could imagine Joshua approaching Jericho. Maybe he is planning the next move. He is probably feeling the weight of preparing for what might be a great battle between the armies of Israel and the armies or defenses of Jericho. When all of a sudden, the Lord appears, as it is written in Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. When Joshua was, was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and be, looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. Joshua is drawn to this figure, a man with a sword in his hand. Who is he going to fight? Who is he going to war with? So Joshua asks this man a question. Are you for us or for our adversaries? But instead of receiving a simple, I'm with you or I'm against you, the man says, no, 
but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And it goes on to say in Joshua chapter 5, verse 14, And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped him and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. This person Joshua is speaking to is a person that represents the Lord himself. We can see this in verse 2 of our text, in chapter 6, verse 2. It is indeed the Lord speaking to Joshua. And in this brief interaction, the Lord is commanding both submission and obedience. So how does the Lord command submission from Joshua? In the question that Joshua asks, are you for us or against us? What is happening behind that question is that Joshua is making himself or the people of Israel the center, right? We are the center of the world and you're either with us or against us. So what does the Lord choose? Neither, because God, our Lord, is the center of the universe, not man, which is the constant temptation that we all face every day not to make ourselves the center of the universe. So the Lord rejects man as the center and responds, no, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. Joshua responds in the only rational way a a person can respond when confronted with their God, by dropping on their face and worshiping. So immediately we see submission. Next, Joshua is worshiping and asks, what does my Lord say to his servant? So the Lord tells Joshua to remove his sandals for the place where they were standing was holy. And Joshua does just that. He shows obedience. And this image of Joshua taking off his sandals and being instructed by the Lord has a strong similarity to Moses, who is confronted by the Lord as he speaks through a burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, verse 5. The Lord speaks to Moses, telling him to remove his sandals for the place they were standing on was holy ground. Joshua here is highlighted as the new Moses. He is to deliver the people of Israel out of exile into the promised land. Entering now into chapter 6 of our text, Israel is near Jericho, and they get a glimpse of the city. In Joshua chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. What was the city of Jericho like? What did the people see and feel about the city? Well, Jericho was this city that was something like a kilometer long. It was oval-shaped. It had a double layer of walls, a, a, a thick layer on the outside, and an inner ring of walls. And as the army of Israel approached, Jericho was going on lockdown. Now, if we did a quick survey, we would see that Israel had some advantages and disadvantages when it came to facing Jericho. On the one hand, the Canaanites were not willing to go out and fight Israel. In chapter 5, we discover that many of the enemy nations had heard about the miracle where Israel, with Joshua, was able to walk across the Jordan River. They heard about this miracle, and it says in Joshua chapter 5, verse 1, that their hearts were melted which basically means that they were very afraid. On the other hand, uh, there were things that made this assault on Jericho very challenging for Israel. The city was great, had very large walls. Military options were somewhat weak. We have no reports that Israel had great siege weapons. And lastly, Israel was a nation in exile. They would traditionally flee nations, not attack them. Therefore, they did not necessarily have a great military aptitude. Therefore, it is somewhat surprising that the Lord just plainly tells Joshua in chapter 6, verse 2, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. Before any battle has been fought, the Lord declares victory. And then he gives Joshua a plan. 
Often when we think of people having courage, we can think merely in terms of the biological. Either some people have courage or they don't. Either some of us are naturally fighters or some of us naturally want to flee. And I'm sure there's some psychological, some biological truth behind that. But in faith, we are to trust God over man. In Numbers 14, verse 9, Joshua tells the people, Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. To fear man when God has given a command, when God has given a command not to, is rebellion. It is trusting in another power greater than God. That's what Israel did when they faced their enemies for the first time under Moses' leadership. But we all can have this attitude where we profess that our God is on his throne, yet when we constantly fear for the future or we fear the opinions of man, what we are doing is we are placing those fears over our God. We are not trusting that he is greater than those things which we fear. God has the power to wipe out every enemy that stands in his way. He has the power not only to destroy the body, but also the soul. In this world, we will face hardship. But as Jesus says in John chapter 16, take heart, for I have overcome the world. Point number two, through the faith of Israel. In Joshua chapter 6, verses 3 through 7, the Lord outlines this plan for Israel, saying, You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus shall you do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all of the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat. And the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. So Joshua, the son of Nun, called to the priest and said to him, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, Go forward, march around the city, and let the armed men pass on before the ark of the Lord. Verses 8 through 14 then show the execution of that plan, for, of the Lord's plan for Israel. Now this plan is somewhat odd from a military standpoint. So what exactly is going on? What's with the horns or this ark? And why is the number seven mentioned so many times? Is there any significance that we're supposed to draw from this? Well, yes. When it comes to the horns, besides maybe being used as a tactic to scare the defenders within the wall, horns were traditionally used by Israel for celebration or a special feast or ceremony. When horns usually were blasted to Israel, it was a sign that God was with his people, and it was a time of rejoicing. What we might wonder about next is the ark. In Joshua's time, the ark was used to reveal God's presence with Israel on earth. When the Lord commanded Israel to bear the ark throughout these several days of marching, what the Lord was communicating was that he was with them. Every day the Lord was present with Israel in the marching and the horn blasting. God was not going to leave them nor forsake them in their mission. And what was the significance behind this number seven? We see this number a lot throughout this chapter. We have seven horns, seven priests. The walls are to fall down flat on the seventh day. Why are Why all the sevens? Well, the number seven in Scripture often signifies perfection or holiness or purity. But more importantly, the number seven in this account parallels the creation narrative. In Genesis, God works his creation for six days, and on the seventh day, he rests. 
when we come to Israel, we see this amazing connection where Israel is to, for six days, walk around the city. But on the seventh day, when everyone shouts and the trumpets blast, God will grant Israel their victory, where they will enter into the promised land, and there they will have their rest. God is renewing Israel, even after the people sinned and were unfaithful. Our Lord gathers his sheep and leads them to their rest. And so the people of Israel follow the instructions of the Lord for six days. Verses 15 through 17 says, On the seventh day they rose early at the dawn of the day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. And at the seventh time, when the Lord, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout for the Lord has given you the city, and the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. This phrase, devoted for destruction, is a curse that was applied to Jericho. To be devoted to destruction has this double meaning of both physical destruction for the city and of something being unredeemed. They were cut off from both physical and spiritual flourishing. In other words, this nation, this people group, had lived their lives in complete and total rebellion toward God. This is not a judgment upon a race or an ethnicity, as we see Rahab and her household were faithful to the Lord and were spared from the curse. In verse 20, we see the climax of this account. It says, So the people shouted, and the trumpets were blown. As soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout, and the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they captured the city. People began shouting, a great shout outside the walls of Jericho. For the past several days, Israel in faith had been doing what the Lord had commanded. Israel obeyed in faith, and God fulfilled his promise to his people, causing the walls of Jericho to fall down flat. Hebrews 11.30-31 to says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for several seven days. By faith Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. By faith, through their faith, God caused the walls of Jericho to fall down. It allowed Rahab to be redeemed. And what really is faith? Some people today think faith is something illogical, something you believe despite the evidence you are given. But this is not the faith we are supposed to have as described in the Bible. Faith is a trust, a firm confidence that what God says is true. Israel has seen the power of God working for the nation. They have seen miracle after miracle, manna from heaven, the parting of the Red Sea, the river of Jordan, water from the rock in the desert. For Israel to have faith in God was not merely rational, but the most rational thing to do. But make no mistake, there are forces that we still fight today. We fight against our sinful desires. We fight against spiritual forces that every day work in this world discord, and unbelief. When Jesus displayed miracle after miracle, proving that he was the Son of God, people still doubted. Ultimately, it is not rational to have doubt in God because sin is ultimately not rational. In faith, we fight a spiritual war, but we are not alone. When we have faith that was purchased by Christ on the cross, we are with God. We are justified before our creator. No longer are we under the wrath of God. Our sin that served as a barrier, a wall between us and God, it falls down. It falls down flat. Through Christ, we are a new creation. We are loved and we will all enter one day into the kingdom to be with our Lord. Finally, that brings us to our third point, for the life of God's people. 
As we enter into our final point of this afternoon, we turn our attention to Rahab. In our text, Rahab and her household were saved from the destruction. Joshua gives this command in verse 22 to the spies. He says, Go into the prostitute's house and bring out from there the woman and all who belong to her, as you swore to her. So the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and mother and brothers and all who belonged to her. And they brought all her relatives and put them outside the camp of Israel. And they burned the city with fire and everything in it. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and of iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. But Rahab, the prostitute in her father's household, and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And she had lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. The story of Rahab underlines the fact that Jericho was cursed because of their rebellion toward God. It was because of their sin and wickedness. Jericho was not cursed or devoted to destruction because they happened to be in the wrong nation or heritage. If Rahab did not have any faith, she too would still be left in the city, which was now devoted to destruction. God worked in the heart of Rahab, granting her faith to save the spies that had come to Jericho earlier. And now the same spies would return, rescuing her and her household. What Rahab needed, and what we all need from God, is mercy. We are like Rahab in that we are included in God's plan of salvation, despite that most of us here are not by blood of Israel. After the battle was completed, Joshua, in verse 26, cursed the land, saying, Cursed before the Lord be the man who rises up and rebuilds the city. Jericho, at the cost of his firstborn, shall lay, he lay its foundation. And at the cost of his youngest son shall he set up its gates. The city is not permitted to be rebuilt. This is to remind Israel and others that this is what unfaithfulness leads to. While faithfully leaning on the Lord means abundant mercy and blessing. Finally, in verse 27, it says, So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was in all the land. <coughs> the Lord was with Joshua. Joshua obeyed the Lord, acted in faith for seven days, and then acted according to his decree. The Lord was with Joshua because Joshua rested fully on the Lord for his victory. The Lord was with Joshua because the Lord said he would be with Joshua. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 5, God said to him, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. God was with Joshua from the beginning to the end. As many of you know, Joshua means in Hebrew, God is our deliverance. Joshua foreshadows Jesus. Joshua brings Israel into the promised land, this land of rest. But as it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 8 through 11, for if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works, as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Jesus is our Redeemer, who brings us true, unending rest. Jesus is the one we follow as he leads us into a greater land and a greater kingdom. When we hear the voice of the one who calls, the one who commands the armies of the Lord, what can we do but humbly submit and worship? That's why the good news, the amazing news of the gospel is that we can have hope 
We can have life. We can receive a great mercy in our Lord Jesus Christ, who like the spies comes to our house and whisks us away from destruction. You cannot buy this love. You cannot earn this love. You can only humbly accept this love. Jesus grants us life instead of destruction to all those who would hear his voice. Jesus gives us this grace so that our only security, our only comfort will be in him. Amen.